So I'm here to talk about uh, sort of a broader perspective on home. And I'm going to start uh, by recounting a couple of an anecdotes or two anecdotes that has come out last couple months while I've been promoting this book. I've been doing radio interviews. And I've done two in New York City. And the first one was in a, with a very uh, a national public radio program, which was very uh, sort of civic-minded. And one of the callers who called in was a, a person who had been formerly homeless. And he, he said how much it resonated with like, some of the stuff I had talked about. Because when he was without his home, he felt uh, diminished as a human. He really didn't feel like he had a place. And so getting back into a home was very important for him for, for in a sense, regaining his, his humanity and how, how it made him feel so much better and how worried and anxious he was when he was on the streets. And then a couple months later, I, then that was interesting, the, the host of the program had been involved with affordable housing movement, something that I know is important there in London. And then the second time I was interviewed uh, on a radio show in New York, this was a show called Ion Real Estate. And it was uh, conducted by a woman who runs a very large real estate company. And she expressed that her clients were also feeling anxiety about the world, about kids, and that she thought that had business for second homes in the Hamptons. Uh, the Hamptons being the very uh, ritzy Long Island beach community uh, outside of New York. And so I thought, well, that's pretty extreme. We had, from New York City, you have people worry about their second homes and people worrying about a home in, in general. But at some level, I think they, they come together because home is so important for feeling uh, secure and comfortable. Um, I'm going to start with a few quotes here that kind of outline what I'm going to cover. This first one, which I hope you can see, is, No matter how dreary and gray our homes are, we people of flesh and blood would rather live there than in any other country, be it ever so beautiful. There is no place like home. And that's, of course, from The Wizard of Oz, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. And to me, that conveys this idea of home being a thing that emerges from the inside out of your head. And in a sense that as a human, the human species, we, we, don't, we live in a very motley collection of buildings, big, small, uh, more or less structured, those that are more connected to the environment, those that aren't. And we really do have a great variety of things that we live in. But still, at, at a core, your relationship with place is a, a sort of common thing and is something that I think needs to be enhanced more um, and something that we can all share. So, so while I'm starting with that quote is because I think that illustrates this core. Quote two says, I secretly understood the primitive appeal of the hearth. Television is its irresistible charm of fire. And I think this, this gets out of both the, an evolutionary historical sense that fire and technology is part of, of home, right? Home is really kind of a big thing we built. It's a big tool to some extent. But it's so essential to what it is to be human that it's sort of, it's hard to, in a, in a, what I call bio, what we call it, my colleagues, we call biocultural thing, hard to separate out this cultural practice of building homes and constructing places to live and our basic emotional biology. And so I'll talk a little bit about where this comes from uh, two million years ago or so. And quote three, this is a quote from 1988, uh, people with mental illness make it their own choice for staying out there there are shelters in virtually every city, and those people still prefer out there on the grates or the lawn to going into one of the shelters. And in the 1980s in the U.S., a homeless, homelessness was really recognized as a major problem, partly as a function of the development of community mental health centers, the emptying of these large hospitals, but also an economic aspect to it as well. And what Reagan is really not acknowledging here in this quote that there was an economic aspect. But it also, I think it's getting, when you say the people out there don't want it, that gets an idea that at some essential level, uh, people don't want to have a home or, or their, their pathology can interfere with their ability to, to make a home. And I, I think to some extent, it's not a primary issue, but many people in the pathology, whether it's addiction or schizophrenia, uh, develop problems with relationships. And if you develop a problem with relationships, one of your fundamental relationships that you have is with the place you live. And so I think there's a, a indication, uh, a suggestion there of how this relates to, uh, again, home being very fundamental to our existence. One of the places where I think you can get an insight, personal insight, if, if into home is, is via home, sec home sickness. And I say they're home-minded as well as home bodies. But the loss of a home, even in a temporary way, 
is, has brought on what some people call a, a mini grief. And this mini grief is, again, a signifier of a loss of a significant relationship. Uh, it's interesting, in the 19th century, the U.S. with this enormous influx of immigrants, uh, actually homesickness was re recognized as a form of mental illness, a pathology, and they called it nostalgia. And over time, nostalgia became much more benign, um, became a kind of uh, a warm reckoning uh, remembrance of where you came from. And it became associated in the U.S. as, say, uh, you know, uh, you might have your, your uh, Italian festival, your Czech festival, or, or, or whatever in your town. And that's nostalgia because you had rebuilt your community. But homesickness was recognized as this debilitating uh, condition, which really is akin to, uh, of de really we'd say it's depression or uh, anxiety, which was due to the homesickness. But they actually thought of it as uh, uh, a primary illness. Uh, there's been a lot of research done on homesickness, uh, understandably on university students who are both handily available uh, for researchers and also as a lot of homesickness amongst that group. And there's this idea that what they, some studies have found is there's a need to belong is a good predictor of whether you're adapt, uh, someone who will have, be homesick or, and be able to overcome it. Is there, are they finding the relationship not just with place but with people? And home is not just about place, it's also about the relationship you have with the people that you share that place with. Now, feeling at home uh, is sort of where I started thinking about this. And what, one of the, the key things about the feelings associated with home is they aren't the big ones, right? They aren't fear, they aren't anger, they aren't ecstasy, right? Those are the things we almost contrast away from. Those are the non-homey things. If you're experiencing emotions, uh, like that, that's, a, that's exciting and different, whereas the homey emotions are, are much more comfortable, secure, and so on. And Antonio Damasio, who I worked, worked with him and his wife, Hannah Damasio, for many years, neurologist, uh, he's classified these sorts of things as background emotions. Background emotions are the emotions and feelings that we use that really keep us in touch with our bodies, with homeostasis, with assessing our, our current state. And those are, point, those are much more important in a home environment. And they, I think, point out why home has been so important for us. Some of these are enthusiasm, subtle malaise or excitement, edginess, tranquility. All those, to me, underlie these like things that we would often say, comfort, security, stability, the, the background emotions, the feelings we associate with home. I say home and homeostasis, that home is a place that's important for recovery, recovering from the world around us, for rest and restoration, and it's also really critical for, in a, in a dependent way, is that as a species, we've come to depend on others for our support. And so home is uh, a place where these most significant relationships that we have are played out and are supported and nurtured. We expect homes, uh, I think there's an interesting phenomenon here, is that we expect our homes to deliver this. Um, that is, if we don't have the expectation of home is not meeting uh, if home is not meeting this expectation of recovery, that will lead to people perceiving that the home is something wrong with it. So it's not just a matter of sleep. It's not just a matter of, of eating and preparing food. But there's a whole package that your body is, in effect, uh, withdrawing from the outer world um, in, to recover. And I say this, this is a, really a perceptual trick, this, this correct, this, this, you know, we have all sorts of things. You know, someone, a uh, professor, or I don't know who said it, uh, we're not safe from a lot of things, you know, a fire or whatever, even, a, you know, in a flimsy structure. But we have this perception that once we're in, you know, we might be 500 feet off the ground in a steel and glass box. Oh, I'm home, I'm safe, right? And gravity could get you there. Next slide. Um, one other interesting thing is that the brain, I say the brain's rest home, and how important it's been uh, for us to have a place where we can rest and when people rest, we think. Now, other animals think. They have consciousness. They engage with the world. They may make plans, but we don't know that. When people started to have language, we made it a bit possible to let others know what we're thinking, let others know what we're planning, and to cooperate. And a home has, at some point, facilitated that. Uh, home is a sphere of empathy. I, I skip him just uh, moving through a little quicker than this. Um, the home is a sphere of empathy, though. It gets to me back to the idea of those critical relationships defined by 
of who you share your living space with. And the point, you asked, some people noticed this as Portman effect, and that was discussed several years, some years ago, including Dick Cheney, where gay marriage was supported by some Republicans, conservative Republicans, who otherwise had no support. This was not part of the agenda at that time of conservative Republicans. They've kind of given up. Most of them have at this point. But conservative Republicans who had gay children tended to support gay marriage. And this kind of gets this idea not just of childhood, but of children and kin, but whoever you share your living space with, you may be, there's a tendency to develop empathy. And of course, militaries have recognized this. You put people, men and women in a bank, in a barracks, and you make them live on the same schedule, and you let them do the same thing. And synchrony is a very powerful way of synchronizing lives. It's a very powerful way of fostering empathy and support. So this is something that does happen in a home. It isn't just necessarily, oh, I'm related to these people. I have these sympathies for them. But I live with these people. I have these sympathies for them. And hopefully they're not negative feelings, because that is very destructive. Now, so that's sort of the basis of the feelings at home. But where does it come from? And I'm going to very quickly go through these slides here. And one of the things we learn about people, about primates, which was what we are, is we're fairly unique in the fact that we build structures. You know, birds and lots of other animals that build structures and live in a place, but not so much our ape and monkey relatives. And one of the structures that we do see built is in the great apes, our closest relatives, orangs, chimpanzees, and gorillas. And every night, they build a nest. And they sleep in it. But they don't sleep in the same spot twice. So they have a home range, but they do not nest. They move along nesting. They build a nest every night. Next slide, please. And there's a gorilla. That's a, there's some little nest in the smallest. One thing I noticed that each of the women who were major researchers for the apes, uh, pioneers took some time to explain, uh, 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 you know, how they built their nest. They're quite intriguing. And you can see there's a chimpanzee on the left in the nest, and there's a primatologist sitting in the nest showing how how robust they are. And there's a, a should be a picture of a gorilla lying in, in his or her nest. Okay, so that's a orang sitting there. And I won't go into too much, but they've been lot, you know. We've been separated from those other apes for probably at least six million years. And they've been separated from each other, you know, this diversion about 12 million years. So we see that this, this behavior probably does go back quite far. And, you know, one, there are reasons why it should be the case, but, you know, various sorts of ecological correlates. But a recent study very recently has shown that sleeping, uh, lying down, and you can see an orang on the ground there in the zoo, and then there's a baboon back there sitting on top of how they sleep in the wild, um, leads to better sleep. And it's probably, and they're, so they're saying, well, maybe it's something, is a, there's a large increased brain size, and behavioral sophistication, there's a chicken and egg issue there. But maybe having better sleep was something that really is essential when you're trying to support a brain that's three, you know, many times larger than, say, that you'd see in a baboon, or three times larger, as you would see ours compared to a great ape. Start about the transition to home. So about two million years ago, our, our relatives, um, we start to see increased brain size. We start to see tool use, stone tool use. They were undoubtedly using tools before then that weren't stone. And an archaeologist back in the uh, 70s and 80s named Glenn Isaac, who unfortunately died uh, way too young, he had this base, uh, what was I call a home base inside a home base model. And he emphasized this corporate responsibility of food, including processing. Uh, using fire, you can't make a fire in a tree, so at some point we may start using fire, we're going to come spend more time in the place on the ground, um, planning with others, uh, making tools. And as Sarah Blaffer Hurdy has emphasized, an anthropologist, humans are also cooperative breeders. And so we're getting help. It's no longer just the mother child pairing, which is so critical in all primates, but by getting help from others in the community and the family. <laughs> Um, humans actually, our ancestors, were able to have more than one child at a time. And, and that was probably part of the, what was very good, uh, critical for us for expanding our range in a way that the great apes who are now just stuck in a, uh, at the expense of the great apes who are now sort of stuck in a tropical zone. Starting probably about two million years ago as being quite critical um, in our evolution. I don't know, the book, the title says, How Habitat Made Us Human, I, I, as a 
bit of publisher hyperbole, but it's very critical in that. Now, that's an interesting point. These archaeologists have pointed out that one of the things that's kind of hard is when dealing with the history of home, the evolutionary history of home, is that those very early structures are very ephemeral. And we really do not have very good evidence of any kind of structure for anything that really predates modern humans. So we can reconstruct our more primitive ancestors living in things like home bases and stuff, but we don't have any structures to go with it. Now, Neanderthals, Neanderthals are our cousins. They evolved separately, but they were closely related enough to us that there are at least some admixture later on. Probably 400,000 to 500,000 years ago, they split from us. And the one thing, and we don't find Neanderthal homes. In fact, there's a quote there that says there's no evidence for substantial houses. But Neanderthals, at least sometimes, we know that Neanderthals did at least two things with their fellow dead. Some of them were eaten by other Neanderthals. Not necessarily all of them, but cannibalism is definitely present in the record. But some of them definitely buried their dead. And there's a picture of a burial there. All these burials date to between 34,000 and 70,000 years ago. Sort of a, and this archaeologist Paul Pettit, you know, he identifies as a cultural practice. Now, 34,000 to 36,000 years of cultural practice is beyond the scope of anything that we're related to culturally. But that at least in some areas, Neanderthals did bury their dead. You know, one of the compelling things, that's actually a burial of a very small child. Those bones like that don't survive very well in the record unless someone covered them up. Now, people often have said this burial is evidence of a symbolic practice, but there really isn't really, there's no goods. They're not like modern human burials. It's not any evidence for that particularly. But I think we can say that they were emotional events because death to a chimpanzee, death to people, we know can be heavily emotional events. And although some archaeologists have referred to burial as corpse retention, as corpse disposal, really it's corpse retention. And it's the corpse being retained in a specific place where people were living. And to me, that reflects a relationship not just among individuals, but to a specific place. So if you were to ask me, and I couldn't tell you, could a Neanderthal feel at home in a way that I think humans feel at home, I would suspect yes. But like anything we have to say about higher level Neanderthal stuff, it's just a speculation. I point out there's also an architectural component in burial and so on. My next, can homo economicus feel at home? That one of the things that's the most dangerous aspect, especially in a hot real estate market, a booming one, is that the security of home can become a confidence amplifier. That is, it's something that you have, you know, economists talk about confidence or lack of confidence. Some things enhance it and some things suppress it. Home as a place of security, also home as a place that in certain Western democracies where home ownership has been strongly encouraged as it has been in Britain since Thatcher, as it has been in the U.S. for over 100 years, home ownership has been equated with participation in the republic and the democracy. And so this anxiety about not being a part of society by being a homeowner, plus the security that goes along with this is my home as a financial instrument, is in conflict. So I think home can be a security illusion. And so I'd say the short answer to that is no. Can homo economicus feel at home? Because there are these sociological, there's even these deeper evolutionary factors that are shaping our attitude towards home. And it will not be, it is difficult for an individual who's using their home as a financial instrument, an investment, to not be swayed by Akron Lawson, as Schiller called them, the animal spirits. Without home, and I'm not going to talk too much about homelessness here, but the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights includes a right to housing. And as far as you can see, the only government entity that has taken that on is Scotland, as put it into their own legal books, that you have a right to humanity. Homelessness and home insecurity are great problems. They're great problems in terms of how they wear on people. As I started off talking, this great anxiety about not having a home means you do not have a place. And there's economic homelessness, homelessness, secondary mental illness, and addiction. As I said, 
I think the most important thing is to recognize that the sort of implicit stigma, you know, I did, I was doing research for things on psychological studies of stigma where they try to, you know, they show you pictures and they look at how your brain lights up. And often, several of those studies, they use a homeless person as the stimulus for eliciting disgust or despair, you know, from a viewer. So I think that a message there about how when someone doesn't have a home, they really aren't, they stop being, they don't have an address. They start not having an address in a physical sense, but they don't have an address in a cultural sense as well. So I think hopefully understanding how the deep evolutionary history of home helps to understand how deep it is in our psyches. And finally, about psychic homelessness, we see children who are in this sort of foster care situation, say, who are just in a home situation where they don't ever develop the feeling at home. They often have trouble later in life having a feeling of home. And it's sort of like, I think there is a critical period, just like there's a critical period to learn language, there's a critical period for learning how to be at home. And if that isn't acquired, they could have problems later in life. So we want our homes to be better. I know the people in this audience are overwhelmingly concerned with helping people have better homes and better home lives. There's a couple of different movements that are very popular, you know, these tiny house movement and the tidy house movement of Marie Kondo. And in a way, those things are about stripping away, to my mind, as I look at them, you know, too much space, too much stuff. Those are things that are distracting people from what? Something more important. They don't often necessarily spell what the more important is, but how to connect to their home environment. And finally, movements like feng shui, I think are critical because just the idea of improving, of having people engage with, this is a home, this is a place, this is not just a place where I put my stuff and I sleep, but it's a place that's psychologically and cognitively critical to my emotional well-being. You know, a lot of people can get there because it's, we are sort of meant to get there, I think, or they've learned to get there. But I think more people than recognize, don't recognize the fact that they need help getting there. And in a way, you know, people go to see therapists for all sorts of relationships in their lives, and they do need to see people. It is helpful for them to see people about this relationship they have with place. Thank you. And there's the picture from my book. For some reason, the artist took the people out of the original picture. It's stuck it on the cover. That's an interesting choice. But that's supposedly, that's from 1850s, an illustration of Swiss lake dwellers. Okay, that's it. Okay.